It's great to see a special season of Clara Law Films screening at Acme from February the 16th to the 26th. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the filmmaker of all these films, Clara Law. Clara, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's so nice to talk to you. And let me first ask you about Drifting Petals, which is your most recent film, which is also quite political, of course. What was the inspiration behind uh, the film? Uh, I, well, first of all, I don't think it is political. I think it is there is politics in it, you know, because <laughs> of the umbrella movement. But I think, you know, the intention probably was because that the situation at that time, because after the umbrella movement, uh, we felt that because we're in Australia and we felt, you know, this is something happening in Hong Kong and we watched and we, uh, you know, we, we felt we, that someone should do something about this, like, you know, film it, you know, like a... Uh, maybe like Men of Iron, you know, do it now, you know, be in there and, and, and did all of that. And we have we didn't hear anything of, of, about that at that time. So Eddie and I thought that mm, maybe we could do something, you know, even though we are far away. So that's how it all started. Um, but then, of course, it was not just about that. You know, for us, it is like a continuation of, this desire of people to fight for their, in a way, a human right, you know, something that we all long for and uh, uh, think that, you know, everyone should be entitled to. And so, you know, this is then we, and to think of that is really about history now, right? Because, you know, this is not just this moment. Yes, it is. But at the same time, it's not just now. There has been a history of you know, struggle, struggling and fighting and and probably, you know, this is China at that time, but in the other parts of the world, probably people share the same thing. So that's how we kind of like develop the story from that onto something else, you know, so that it become more uh, different layers of, you know, it, something more complex than just one movement because there's a lot that it uh, call up, you know, for more uh, understanding and the narrative kind of begin to kind of shape up to be something much more complex than just that. Fair enough. No, thank you for that uh, explanation. It's, that's very clear. And, uh, and, and it's so interesting how your films um, do talk about culture. They talk about relationships, about mm. uh, moving on, and so on. And and uh, I mean, floating life, goddess of nineteen sixty seven, such uh, uh, incredible films. Um, when you uh, write and direct, uh, I know you work with Eddie Fong. When you write and direct uh, your films, um, are there particular moments of inspiration or? or or themes or ideas that you want to put into all of your films? I think, you know, films is like, for us, like the whole of you. So whatever you reflect on during that period of your life, uh, things that uh, you felt from, from the outside, right? What is happening in the world? and what is happening within yourself, uh, they all work with each other or against each other. And so, uh, and, and you have, you know, and, and you bring, of course, always to the film, your own culture, your own memories, your own reflection, your own understanding, and also you want to express something. So it is a holistic process. And, um, both Eddie and I, we are very curious people. You know, we like to, you know, look around, very acute to our, you know, what is happening around us. We talk a lot, you know, of everything, everyday things that happened. Uh, and there's nothing to do, it doesn't have to do with work. It's really just, you know, a reflection on things that uh, happen around us. And, and, and they kind of become part of our life and it just seeps into your blood and, and your thoughts and your soul. And you just then need to bring it out, 
and, and, and get it out, you know, because there's a lot then you want to, to share, you know, with other people because it's not just the two of us, you know, there's the world around us and we want to share. And, and I think, you know, that is what, what uh, our life has been, our creative life and our life, you know, because we it kind of work together at the same time. <laughs> like, you know, what we have done now with, with um, a Drifting Paddles, because of Drifting Paddles, we set up our home studio our own post-production studio. And so, you know, the studio uh, is just next to our kitchen. The studio is in the rumpus, right? And in there, we can do our editing, we can do our sound. Uh, it, we, we kind of insulate it so that it can become a kind of, kind of insulated uh, venue. <laughs> and um, then, yeah, and then we can do our grading, we can do, you know, our, even up to the DCP, you know, we all did it all within that studio. But at the same time, we can, you know, walk out to the kitchen and make a soup so that we can eat anytime we like, or we can close the studio anytime we like, and it never closes anyway, you know, so it's 24 hours things. So so it's kind of like it becomes our, our, our daily thing, you know, it, 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 we can't separate our life and our work. And, you know, what we feel, what we reflect, what a philosophy book that we have been reading, uh, Dr. Yeski that we have been reading, or you know that, that when I you know say read uh, uh, the story of the um, Kama Kama Rus brothers, you know I I there's this, this scene and I would say look Eddie I mean how could Dr Yeski think of this how could he you know be like you know so much of a prophet and and things like that you 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 it just came out anytime and this is you know the great thing about you know having a partner that share with you all your life knows you and understand and know what you're talking about so that with a few words you can you know exchange and 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 understand each other and then you know it then becomes part of the story that whatever that we are working on so so it's i don't know how whether i have explained myself clear enough but that was what it was like you have and and it, it is such an interesting process but it also means uh, by the sounds of it that you don't need obviously big budgets or big production behind you because your films are much more down to earth if you like and don't need that sort of big production value and i suppose you don't even need want that uh yes and no you know you know the bigger the budget normally the more the compromises <laughs> so that's the situation so when we say even when we were working on temptation of a monk which was probably you know maybe one of the biggest bigger budgets of our film uh which we did in uh in in china at that time that was when china was just opening up and that was a very very hard film to do very challenging there was a lot of uh, things that people don't understand, uh, the, you know, the normal practice and that kind of thing. Um, but even with bigger budget, there's always not enough money. It is never enough because, you know, the, the kind of things that you think can make it perfect will always need a little bit more time, a little bit more money, a little bit more support. But through the years, we have learned you know, as I said, you know, compromises can only be up to a certain standard. And the bigger the budget, the harder it is because you have to make more compromises and there's less freedom. So in order to have that freedom, you just have to make less a budget film. And when we write our script, we always have that in mind because luckily, you know, Eddie has, has been and can, can, will continue to be a producer, which he doesn't really enjoy you know he, he would rather be just the writer but he knows that you know this is our life we have to do that and I am totally hopeless with figures hopeless with figures I cannot make a good calculation of anything you know you tell me this is two billion and I don't understand what it is that kind of thing that's me so he has to take up that job so so we have to make do with what we have always but I suppose the technology nowadays has progressed to this point where you can actually, with much less money, do things that could never have been done before. So say with Drifting Paddles, there never had been more than five people on set. 
And Eddie and I was the only two professionals. And and Eddie, you know, was the one that was holding the camera. And I was the one that, you know, looked on that little, you know, small screen to try to imagine this is a video assist because it is not. While one of my eyes is looking at the, at the actors and, and one of my eyes is looking at that in order to make sure the frame is okay. So it's that kind of thing. Uh, but there's a lot of freedom, you know, because with that small camera, you can go anywhere. You can jump into the MTR, you know, and, and, and no one even, you know, look at you at all because they think you're just taking a picture while you're actually shooting a film, right? And, and you don't have to apply for anything because you know, you don't, they won't even know after you have done an hour you know, in the train. Uh, so it's that kind of give and take. And, and, and in order, say, to do that post-production studio, of course, you know, the, the, the give and take is that we actually work much longer hours because, you know, you never get, cannot get out of that. You know, you know that, okay, let's have, we have to do this. And you jump into that studio and you, you start working. And then once you start working, both of us will not know the time. So, you know, then you ended up being very tired. But at the same time, that freedom means that you actually can do things much easier nowadays. It's like, you know, writing now. Like, you know, you, 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 writing is a piece of paper. Now, you know, you just go to the laptop and, and you just think. So, so that's the kind of thing that, that happened nowadays. And, and we actually think of this uh, DIY thing because we knew that by 2015, after doing my last film, the film that I did uh, in China, which is called The Unbearable Likeness of Inspector Fan, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the most challenging thing in the sense that it was, I was the most unhappy. Because, you know, what happened there, uh, film is not a film. It's really just a product product. It's, it's hard, you know, to describe that feeling. And the worst part of it was after I finished the film and it was being released and it was in the cinema. And then a few days later, they put that onto uh, the streaming. But then they put the wrong version in it. They put the one with the green screen in it. So all those uh, CGI things was not in there. You know, all the wires and everything was there. It was that bad. I mean, it was the worst nightmare any filmmaker can have. Mm. So that was <laughs> like, you know, you, it was a step too far, you know, and, and, and it was like, can we do things just on our own without, you know, having to deal with this, you know, not having to find the money and, and, and do the things and all this compromise. And that was how the idea came about, you know, why don't we just buy our own camera? Because Eddie played with Super 8. I don't know, you probably would know Super 8, right? Yep. Super 8 when he was a kid, you know, he played Super 8. He, so he, he knew the camera well, and he also liked to take stills. So he thought, okay, let's, let's just do, uh, buy our own uh, 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 digital stuff and, and let's try. And with Letters to Ali, you know, that we, we actually had done that before. Uh, and that was a high eight at that time. So Eddie was the cameraman at that time. And, and, and I was the sound man. I was just, you know, I was a sound woman do, doing all the recording. So we thought, oh, we could do this with this one. He would just be the camera and I'll be on sound and uh, we're with the writer and then I'm the director, here's the camera and, and we can do it. But, you know, <laughs> hello. What happened was on the first day of shoot and there was the first day of shoot was when we did it in Mudura, you know, in the great walls, walls of China. And I was having this, you know, uh, 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 sound recorder. And I was, uh, Jeff was there, and I was like, okay, roll sound, roll camera, and I was uh, watching him and then after we finished. And then I really, I of course realized, of course, I didn't have put the sound on. So it was a total mess. <laughs> I realized that I could not be both the director and the sound on this because it's not documentary. It is more like, you know, drama. And I have to be so focused, you know, on the acting and everything. So finally, when we went to Hong Kong, we did look for someone to help with the sound, but she was actually, she had no experience at all, you know, with sound. So it was really teaching her how to do it. It was simple, not so hard nowadays, but you could, you could learn it even when you are uh, amateurs, but it's just that you have to put the time in. 
that is so interesting to hear all of these uh, stories about the filmmaking process and, 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 and it, it is fascinating stuff. It really is. It, uh, people don't recognise how complex filmmaking is and how you have to be in control of so many different facets at the same time. Yeah. yeah. But so, you know, when we were in Sydney and and um, and Bridget, uh, uh, a show, uh, we showed uh, Drifting Paddles in Sydney at that time in a Sydney Film Festival, and uh, we were in the Q and A, and and we we talk about the DIY and everything. But uh, Bridget did mention that you know, but of course you know you have the thirty years of experience behind you, so with us there's a lot of you know on set experience and also a lot of post uh, 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 sound mixing and everything. So all of this is instilled was already instilled in you. So when we did our calibration at home with our sound and you know listen to the bee the sound. You know, all of that was in our head. We know that, you know, what Roger was doing, you know, in his uh, uh, sound mix and, and and calibration with the monitor and everything. All of this was already in us. So, you know, we were very careful with each step, you know, that we did it like what every professional should do and what a professional film should look like. And the joy of first watching it in Sydney, in Paris, with our DCP, because it's the first time that we watch it. And sitting in that cinema, that very nice, just newly built palace cinema. And we sat in the middle and we heard and we watched and it was even better than what we were watching in our own monitor at home and better, the sound really 5.1 surround sound around us. And it, especially with the 10 scene where you, know, you felt the sound wrapping around you and that was like, I was so, so like, you know, moved to tears because it was, we did it. It was telling us that we could do it like this. And it was just that last, you know, acknowledgement that it could be done. That is great to hear. And what an experience that would have been for you. That uh, that was fantastic. Look, I know I need to to wrap up. I just want to ask you about your first film, which is premiering um, at Acme as part of your screenings. They say the moon is fuller here. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that film as your first film? Yeah, it was when I uh, I went to uh, uh, England to study. I went to the National Film School. Um, and and I was um, uh, there was a hard process to get into because you know National Film School is they only took taking uh, twenty five students every year. It's a three years master course, um, and only five foreign students. And I have to fly from Hong Kong to uh, UK to be interviewed. And it was very dramatic that interview. It was a long table. It was I was spotlighted, and then all everyone ten of them were sitting in the dark, and they asked you questions. But when you got in and, and I did get in, finally, I had to go back to Hong Kong and I was, um, uh, I was told that I could get, I got in. The thing, the great thing is they give you 10,000 pounds. So it's a little bit like a scholarship to make your films, but they encourage you to do three short. But what I wanted to do is to do feature because I had done short already in RTHK. So I kind of, you know, did a little trick. I was a, a little, you know, trying to convince them that the script that I wrote is really a short, only 40 minutes, but I knew that it's going to be long because I, the, the rhythm, the way I'm going to pace it is going to be different. But they asked me to read the script. So I did and I read it within a 40 minutes. So they said, okay, pass. You can, you, can, you, can, you can go and do your film. So I did. So it was like, again, as I said, total freedom because it's a student film. The money is there. I have got the ten thousand pound totally in it. All my mates, you know, they if they want to do camera, if they want to do gaffer, if they want to do light, they have to put in their own ten thousand, a little bit from that, so that they could put that into different films. So I've got all the money there ready, and so I could shoot my film like that. Except for the fact that I didn't have the female lead at that time. I got every act audition and all done, but without the lead. And then finally, you know, my mice got really impatient that, look, we have all the money, we can go and do the film. Why don't you do it? So I acted in it. So that was my experience of being the first, you know, acting, directing, first feature, all of that. Again. And it was fun, fun, but, you know, hard, hard, mentally hard. Yeah. 
Well, again, congratulations. And and you've now made uh, so many uh, excellent films and uh, really yes. beautifully made films. I mean, I, I really love Floating Life and I love Goddess of 1967, as I've mentioned. They're so, so interesting stories. And, and it tells so much about the, uh, I suppose, the cultural experiences uh, of the people in your stories, but of your own. Uh, I suppose, to some extent, story as well. So, and I yeah. guess... And the next one will be something here, something from the Literature Power Shop. It will be something here of the Aussie Bond, the third generation. And I hope that we can, fingers crossed, that we could find the money and make it. Sue Masson is going to produce it. Oh, look, excellent. Look, Clara, it's been great talking to you and uh, the season of films, five films at ACME from February the 16th to the 26th. Uh, and uh, Clara Law, thank you so much for talking with me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's nice talking to you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.